arguably an even more important item to this house. This item here belonged to one of the emperor's daughters, and when there was really hard financial times here, she went into the city of Bath and sold this to someone so she would have a little bit of money to bring to her household. These videos were made with minimum editing involved to give you an authentic feel of the city. Hope you enjoy. What's up guys? Welcome to His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie's home here in Bath, England, okay? And that was a mouthful <laughs> for me to say. But yeah, we finally made it here. I saw you guys like when I went to Bob Marley's house, so I thought this would be something cool for you guys to see as well. And um, yeah, this is, a, this, this is the home he had while he was living here. So now, I was told I can film here, but not everything. So with that being said, this is your invitation to come here and see this ground for yourself, all right? So it's a really quick trip from London. All I did was take a train from London. It took one hour and then I took an Uber, which was nine euro. And it took 10 minutes to get to this area. 10, 15, more like 10, 12 to get here. So it's easy. In order for me to explain why he was living here, I'll show you this quick plaque real quick. These are a plaque that explains what this home is for. And so I think this is in uh, Ethiopian. And here it is in English right here. And it says, during the years of 1936 to 41, of exile from his beloved country of Ethiopia, occupied by the forces of aggression, his Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie the first Emperor of Ethiopia resided in Bath in this villa. In memory of his residence and in appreciation of the warm and courteous hospitality of the people of Bath, his Imperial Majesty has donated Fairfield Villa to the corporations of Bath to serve as a home for the age, May 1958. So essentially, this place right here is for the elderly, okay? I don't know if elderly people live here, but it's for the people who are older, all right? But let's check out this grounds from outside first. For those who don't know the, the importance of Haile Selassie, especially to the Rastafarian religion, basically it says that the Emperor Haile Selassie's bloodline is a direct bloodline to King Solomon from the Bible. So because of this, and a prophecy from Marcus Garvey, uh, many people have come to believe that the Emperor Haile Selassie is the second coming or the Messiah. All of this helped cultivate a belief which is the Rastafarian belief, all right? So that's why I'm showcasing this. And yeah, this is a, for many people a spiritual land. So just to give you a brief story, he was in Ethiopia and his country got invaded and so he uh, went into exile all the way here in Bath, England. And so this is the house he was living in for the last four and a half years, right before he was re able to reclaim his country. If you're wondering how you book a tour, you can go online. But heads up, tours are only on Sundays. So keep that in mind. Like if you're gonna be here in the UK and on a Sunday, particularly, that might be something you wanna do. Or you can incorporate it in your tour. So first thing first, we're just gonna go ahead and check out the, the grounds from outside. All right, um, I might be the only one for this tour at the moment. Um, I was just talking to some of the staff. They said they never know who's gonna pop up. All right, so let's check out how beautiful this place is. And yeah, he was here for four and a half years. All right, in some reports, he, it seemed like he felt real secluded in this particular area. As you can see, this is the main driveway. There's more than one way you can come into this particular place, but yeah, this is your main driveway. People would come in from that gate right there, you see, and they would drive in. You can imagine he, him just walking down this particular path, just contemplating what his plans are for Ethiopia. So, really interesting to see, and probably his security was hanging out in this area. <laughs> Wow, okay, it's a big uh, compound in a way and I think this is where they hand, handle all the business for the grounds here. Wow, look how beautiful it is from the backyard. 
vehicle, right? Really nice. So this is, the steps I'm walking are the steps he took when he was living here. So Fairfield House, this is home to His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie I, his government, his priesthood, and his family during the years of exile from 1936 to 1941. Some members of the Ethiopian royal family lived here up to 1943, so that was seven years overall they lived in the city of Bar. Then, upon re returning to Ethiopia, the emperor returned to the city of Bath in 1954, 70 years ago, and shortly afterwards, he gifted his home to the city as a token of this warm appreciation that he had for the people of Bath. That still continues today, the elderly daycare here, but the story of how this all came to be and what happened along the way is what you get on the historical guided tour and we'll begin on the front lawn. Make it anyway, make your way. <laughs> Sorry. So I'll go here if you okay. gather that way. And where we're going first is 1935. Mussolini is in control of fascist Italy. This is this era of these strong men of Europe. Hitler is around also. Mussolini has set his sights on Ethiopia and this is the second time that the Italians have tried to colonize the country. The first was in 1896 and they lost famously at the Battle of Adwa, which is this great African victory over colonialism that halted European expansion in Africa. And it's still celebrated as this great African victory today, including here at Fairfield House. Mussolini, when he saw the Italians march off to Adwa, he was a schoolboy at that time in his teenage years. And he felt totally ashamed to see this modern Italian army march off to Africa and lose against what he considered to be barbarians. So now he's propagandizing to the Italian public and he's letting them that know that they need their place in the sun and that this is destined to be Ethiopia. They're going to right these wrongs according to him. So he invades Ethiopia. Emperor Haile Selassie, he's the emperor of Ethiopia at that time. He's, he's been the emperor for five years. He's reporting what Mussolini is doing to the League of Nations because Ethiopia has been a member of the League since 1923. And if you are a member state of the League of Nations, you're supposed to look at another member state as an equal. You're definitely not supposed to be preparing to invade them. So this is the beginning of an international crisis that has the world's attention. And if we, in modern time, that reflection of that is Ukraine, Palestine, because in this time in Britain in the 1930s, people were hand making Ethiopian flags to fly outside their homes to show that they were anti-fascists. So the emperor, he mobilizes the Ethiopian people to fight back and he does a general proclamation to his people and he says that everyone, if you're able-bodied enough and you don't have any dependents, you must leave your home to join one of the armies that's going off to defend your country. The emperor, the highest office in the land, he didn't discount himself from this process. He joined the Ethiopian army, he led the Ethiopian army and he manned an anti-aircraft gun, sometimes firing back to the, uh, the Italians for four hours at a time. Because these Italian bombers, they were spreading mustard gas, poison gas. And this is unprecedented in world history. This is modern mechanized warfare, warfare that the world is seeing for the first time. Mussolini has shipped a million tons of poison gas to Ethiopia. Across the north of Ethiopia in that time, it was total devastation. There was poisoned waterways, there was tens of thousands of people dying or burned, breathing in pain. There was dying animals because the waterways, the farmlands had also been poisoned. The emperor led the Ethiopian army in a head-on collision with the Italians at the Battle of Maichu. After this battle, the Ethiopian government, the Ethiopian force were forced to retreat and the Ethiopian government ministers came together in an emergency council of 24 ministers. 
2021 of those ministers of government voted for their emperor, Haile Selassie, to leave his country, something unprecedented for an Ethiopian emperor, and to go and speak his case personally to the League of Nations. There had never been a head of state stand in a council, a body of the nations of the world, and give an address, let alone for their defenseless people. So this is what the emperor faithfully did. He arrived in Britain in early June 1936, and at the end of the month he was in Geneva, Switzerland, and he gave one of the most poignant and prophetic addresses in world history at the League of Nations. He told the nations of the world on that day that God and history will remember your judgment here. He told the nations of the world on that day that he's standing for all small peoples of the world that are faced with aggression and asked them, what answer am I going to take back to my defenseless people? The emperor didn't get the answer that he wanted at the League of Nations. It was worse than that. There was collusion between European states for this African country to be stripped of her territory and presented to Italy. So the emperor knew he had to come into exile for a long period of time. He's looking at a map of Africa and he sees Ethiopia. And Ethiopia is the only uncolonized major country in Africa in that time. He's surrounded by a sea of colonial neighbors. On his borders, the emperor has already foreseen the fascist alliance between Italy and Germany. Now he's taking a gamble strategic gamble. He's here in Britain and he's going to try and drag the British government into the war on a moral argument. He has the support of the British people but he doesn't have the support of the British government. They're appeasing Mussolini at that time and that's their strategy to stop Italy and Germany fighting together which they ultimately did. So there's a scene where the Emperor goes into the House of Commons restaurant in the Houses of Parliament and Stanley Baldwin, the British Prime Minister, hides under a table because he doesn't want to be seen talking to Emperor Haile Selassie. So the Emperor knows that this isn't helping his cause to cause embarrassment for the British government and someone in the Emperor's party, one of his advisors, says let's try Bath. The Emperor came to Bath first on a two-week holiday in August 1936. He was staying at the Bath Spa Hotel he took the healing waters of Bath on his mustard gas burned arms in the mineral pool. He really liked the atmosphere of the city and after the initial um, vivacious welcome he was given by the people of Bath, they respected his privacy and gave him and his family the privacy that he needed to recover in that time. He appreciated this so he called for estate agents to show him a range of properties. They brought him here to Fairfield House and he purchased this with his personal funds for £3,500 and that sounds like a bargain today but in those days it was a lot of money it was the best part of a quarter of a million pounds which still sounds like a bargain today but the Emperor's strapped for cash this is a very difficult financial time for him at Fairfield House so he's made an investment here this is where he's going to bide his time this is where he's going to work poli politically to liberate his country. This is where he's going to protect his family. In move the Ethiopian royal family, and so begins five long difficult years of exile here. It was occasionally reported on this front lawn that where we're standing, that colorful religious celebrations were seen to take place. Festivals like Timcat in the Ethiopian calendar would have happened with the priests circling the house here. Still today, thanks to the Rastafari and the Ethiopian community, we still have colourful religious celebrations that happen here at Fairfield House all the time. The Emperor had his 45th birthday party on the front lawn here in 1937. He had a small marquee, we think it was down that end of the lawn. It was lined with the Ethiopian colours and carpeted with two thrones, one for Emperor and Empress. And the Emperor and Empress stood before the thrones and they greeted residents of Bath and supporters of the Ethiopian cause. People like Sylvia Pankhurst, the famous suffragette, would have been here on that day. She's a great part of the Emperor's story here at Fairfield House and you'll hear more about her as we go round. Any questions? Let's go.
So on this moment of the tour, we just jump out of the 1930s side to talk about what happens at Fairfield House today. Because the Emperor gifted his home in 1958 for the good of the people of Bath, particularly for the aged. And it soon after became a residential care home in the 1960s. It was a residential care home here up to the early 1990s when new regulations meant it was no longer fit for purpose to be used as a residential care home. The house would have had to totally change layout. It's not possible in a listed building. So it became a day centre for Bath's elderly. A number of organisations moved in and one of those organisations is called Bath Ethnic Minority Senior Citizens Association, BEMSCA for short. They began a day service of Bath's elderly ethnic minorities. It started off with the Caribbean community, known as the Windrush Generation, but soon the Chinese community of Bath joined, the Indian community of Bath joined. There's elderly people from all across the world that received these services of BEMSCA during the working week. Fairfield House is also a very special place to people of Bath representing their relationship with Africa. And this is a positive relationship here in this building, not like, unlike some of the other buildings in Bath that with their arms twisted now, they're spilling the beans on their history. We are shouting from the rooftops that this building represents a positive relationship the city has with the, the continent of Africa. And we have charities that help support us here at Fairford House by having their headquarters here. And those are charities like Headway, the Brain Injury Association, First Impressions that help women that are out of the workforce get back into the workforce, and the Coombe Down Holiday Trust who help vulnerable people go on holidays and have experiences, visit family and stuff. They have their headquarters here also. So Fairfield House, this place where we're standing, all around the house, to the Rastafari community, arguably the most sacred ground in the world outside of Ethiopia. This is where His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, or to the Rastafari movement, that's the return Messiah, Jesus Christ in his kingly character, returned to earth. This is where he lived and worked. Soon He lived here soon after he made a speech to the world that through the Rastafari viewpoint is a sharp two-edged sword coming from his mouth that will smite the nations forevermore. To the Ethiopian community of Britain, this is a very special place representing their history and heritage. And all through the year we have Ethiopian days of celebration. And I don't know if anybody knows, but Ethiopia is on a different calendar to us. It was their new year a few days ago, and now it's 2017 in Ethiopia. So if you want to feel seven years younger, you just fly to Ethiopia, you're automatically seven years younger. But because of their different calendar, their celebrations are at different times. So their Christmas here, celebration here is in January. Their Easter time is in May. Their new year just coming up, and the celebration for the community is coming up, and that's in September. And amongst that Ethiopian community, are children that have been adopted from Ethiopia into British families so they come here to learn about their history and heritage from other community members. So Fairfield House is a very important place for many different communities but over the years there's been some jeopardy here. The house was threatened with sale a number of times and the communities have always risen to the challenge to say how important Fairfield House is and why the Emperor's gift should be respected. So we're in a more positive time now because we formed a community interest company in 2019 to represent those different communities so that we could start speaking with the local authority, uh, Bath and North East Somerset Council. We're now working in partnership with the council and we have the lease for the building for our community and we're working towards a long lease being passed. So we're in a lot more positive time here. And us opening to the public and you coming to support is a reflection of that. So thank you very much as well. Any questions about Fairfield House today? Okay, did a good job. Um, yeah, go on. Uh, a little bit more on, so they were trying to sell the, the home? Yeah, so um, when that, there was that change in 1993 going into 1994, um, basically it was new regulations that meant each person in a care home space needed a certain amount of space and so there wouldn't be enough people in there um, under these new regulations for it to be self-sufficient. So the council had a legal decision at that time, different council, um, Avon County Council, and they felt that they could 
go against the Emperor's purpose and just sell the property. So that was the first time that the community rose up to say no, that's not appropriate and then in moved it in as day centre and then in 2012 it happened again and the house was threatened with sale and said that you know it couldn't continue in this way so it's happened a number of times but these things like the Ethiopian people experienced as well in wartime they help galvanize different peoples together and so we're working on a common purpose here which makes it very unifying place you know yeah and if there's anything we could do to make sure or you're doing it, you're, you're supporting Fairfield House, but after this, spreading the word about your experience here, you know, sending more visitors to us is very helpful. Um, and if, you know, amongst you there's multi-millionaires, then we've got a big list of developments that we would like to make to, the, to protect the Emperor's legacy here, you know? Okay. So, yeah. Is All there, right. Sorry, the, um, how is the various wars and conflicts with Eritrea and Somalia and things actually affected? Ethiopian community here? Um, that's an interesting question because uh, a large number of our community were those that um, left Ethiopia in 1975 or the early 80s under the time of the revolutionary government and it's their families and others that have joined them in Britain. But um, uh, uh, you know, we have Eritreans here on the tour that love the Emperor as well, so it's, it's really a mixed bag within Ethiopia um, overall in terms of opinion. But in recent times, the government of Ethiopia, not promoting them, but they um, have started opening the country's heritage to the public, which is quite an important move, and they even sent people here to see how we're opening Fairfield House to the public. So we're like leading the way in that, you know, uh, looking again at the Emperor's legacy and what he's left in the world. Yeah. Do you have a relationship with Jamaica or with the Rastafarian community there? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, amongst our community, we, you know, we've had Rastafari that have been here at Fairfield House for 30 years from Jamaica um, and other um, members of the community and Pauline inside, the manager of Bemska, um, she travels to Jamaica regularly and is from Jamaica also. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very international house. So after your tour, you're most welcome to have a little look inside the Bath Windrush Centre. And this was opened last year, um, and it has the memories of the impact of the Bath Windrush generation and what they brought to Bath from the 1950s. We had hundreds of nurses from the Caribbean that were tra training in Bath that brought their culture and their families and their traditions and other members of the community as well. So have a little look in, in there afterwards. But we're going just here. <coughs> So all of a sudden, in October 1936, the 9th of October, there was 25 Ethiopians that moved in here to Fairfield House. That was the emperor and his family, his ministers, and his attendants. So it was like a small Ethiopian refugee community had just been implanted into the city of Bath all of a sudden. They were in October, and they were soon in this very dark and difficult British winter time and they were fe feeling very estranged from their country in that time. And when they found themselves in February 1930, they were in the most tragic period of the whole of the exile time. The Italians had been occupying Addis Ababa, the capital city of Ethiopia, for a number of months. And with the educated Ethiopians in the city, they were playing relatively nice. There was new banks, there was new roads, there was new cars, new products, they're trying their best to convince those Ethiopians that the colonization that they're bringing to Ethiopia is a good thing. But there was Ethiopians that rebelled and they threw grenades at General Graziani while he was giving a public address. In response, an injured Graziani and a Mussolini ordered a full-scale Roman reprisal attack against the Ethiopians. Thousands of black shirt troops who were the thuggish hooligan troops that brought Mussolini to power. They were ordered to march on the city of Addis Ababa and they began to massacre the civilian population. In 72 hours over 30,000 Ethiopians had been killed 
almost half the population of the city of Addis Ababa. The streets were running with blood. There was nowhere for people to go other than the British Embassy and a number of other places in the city that was protected by soldiers, their own soldiers in that time. The Emperor had to receive this news, trickle in piece by piece here at Fairfield House and each blow was more devastating than the next for the Emperor and his family. We know that it was the Emperor's responsibility to go to his great advisor and friend Ras Kassa's room and to inform him that two of his sons had just been murdered by the Italians. We know that it was the Emperor's responsibility to go to his eldest daughter, Princess Tanania Work's room, and to let her know her husband had just been captured and murdered by the Italians, and that this was being shown off on their national newspapers, because he was one of the top gen generals of Ethiopia. <coughs> it was around this time, because it was so difficult for the Ethiopians that were here, the Emperor had written to the Archbishop of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church in Jerusalem, and he said, because of our situation in Bath, we must have our faith, we need our church. So from Jerusalem were sent three priests, and they brought with them a very sacred item called a tabot. The tabot that they brought was called Medhani Elem, which is another name for Jesus Christ. And a tabot itself is a sanctified replica of the Ark of the Covenant from a Bible. It's this item which makes an Ethiopian church a holy space. They took up residence in a large Victorian greenhouse that stood at the back here. If you look at the diagonal, the, on the left hand wall there's a diagonal piece of slate and this is where this roof came across of this double greenhouse building and it somewhat mirrored the conservatory in style. This became an Ethiopian Orthodox Church, the first Ethiopian Orthodox Church in this country. It was known as the House of the Afflicted because they were suffering so much whilst they were here. And this is where they would pray daily for the liberation of their country. A few years ago there was no special garden here. It was fenced off and covered in brambles and people would come from all across the world, especially Ethiopia, and they'd say, where was the town? <coughs> so we'd bring them over here, we'd peer through the fences, we'd say, we think it, it used to be somewhere back there. When we started negotiating the lease that we now have with the local council, we were informed by one of our friendly local councillors that this area was not to be included in the lease of Fairfield House, including this non-historic caretaker's bungalow that's now the Bath Windrush Centre. And this was unacceptable to our different communities here, so we took direct action. And this sacred garden was our protest to say that this area is important to Bath's history. When the Emperor and his family left here, the chapel was deconsecrated and the tabot was taken to a new church that the emperor had built to recognize his relationship with the city of Bath in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. This church is called Miske Hazanan Medhani Elen, which is the consoler of the bereaved and the savior of the world in exile, so Detanyol Medhani Elen it's also known as. On the front of the church the emperor has a sign and he speaks about his relationship with the city of Bath and how this tabot sustained him there and his Christian faith. So we go inside now, the sacred garden. April 1941, this is the exact place that Her Imperial Majesty Empress Menin was when she found out about the liberation of her country. An attendant burst into the chapel and they would have entered from roughly where the entrance of that plastic greenhouse is. They came to this back room which was heated where the Empress was praying. They interrupted her which would have been very unusual and they said to her, our country is free. When the, when the Empress heard the news, she said that she couldn't quite allow herself to trust that it was true until she heard that news from the Emperor himself. When Empress Menin found out that Ethiopia was actually free, she began to arrange a party for residents of Bath and supporters of the Ethiopian court. 
And in the history of Fairfield House, especially modern time, we've had some amazing celebrations here. But there would have been no more meaningful celebration than this time in May 1941, when Ethiopia was liberated finally with British assistance. It was said of Ethiopia it was the first to be captured by fascism, and now it was the first to be freed. So it represented a hope for all the world. People were dancing and cheering inside. The mayor of Bath was toasting the emperor back on his throne. But although it was a joyous time, it would have been quite strange because this is 1941. It's in the middle of World War II. And within 10 months, bombs are raining down here in Bath. It's the Bath Blitz. And everybody old enough that read the newspapers would have realized that their former neighbor Emperor Haile Selassie had warned about exactly this happening in the world back in 1936 and now it was happening in Bath. When we created the Sacred Garden we chose the Star of David because this is one of the Emperor's personal symbols and he claims <coughs> descent from the union of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba from the Bible. At the Emperor's coronation on the 2nd of November 1930 nations from across the world as far away as Japan, the United States, Britain, France, Sweden, Germany, they all sent their representatives to this independent African country to bow down and bring gifts and pay their respects to this new monarch that was receiving the traditional titles, King of Kings, Conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah, Elect of God. These are some of the titles that the emperor inherited at that time. It was at that time that we like to say that the emperor became mystically intertwined with the city of Bath. Bath is a city that's founded on hot springs. Deep below us there's hot water. Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, is also founded on hot springs. So they share that connection. But for the emperor's coronation ceremony, he had harmonized the ancient Ethiopian coronation with the ancient British coronation ceremony and they're both to do with the coronations of King Solomon and King David. So for the Emperor's coronation, he sent a advisor to Jerusalem, and he said, please bring back a very special sacred stone, and that will start a new tradition that the Emperor of Ethiopia is also crowned on a special stone, just like the King of England is. And the reason that that intertwines the Emperor with the city of Bath is because the first King of England is crowned in Bath Abbey in 973. So unbeknownst to him, or maybe he knew about it, the emperor had already stepped into these royal traditions that are emanating from the city of Bath. So we leave the sacred garden now, but it's also a place where people come to remember their loved ones today. We leave the sacred garden now, and we'll just make our way around the house. His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie, his name Haile Selassie, it means power of the Holy Trinity in Amharic. And before his coronation, when he took on this name and told the world that that was his regal name, he was known as Ras Tafari Makonnen. So in the 1920s, 1924, 100 years ago, Ras Tafari was on his first tour of Europe. He was at the opening of the Paris Olympics as well, 100 years ago. He was the African head of state that was there and he came to London, he received a degree from Cambridge University. But in the Caribbean, there was a group of people and they were ostracized, they were pushed to the fringes of colonial society because they were saying that we've read about this man, Rastafari, in the Bible. He's going to have those titles, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah. He's the Universal Redeemer. He's going to help take us back to Africa. The Rastafari movement have made known some of the symbols of Ethiopia in modern times all across the world. So our flag that is always flying at Fairfield House, the Lion of Judah flag, is one of the most seen flags at music festivals and events representing Ethiopia. And that's thanks to the Rastafari movement in modern times. It represents 3,000 years of Ethiopian history. And this hasn't been Ethiopia's flag since 1975, when there was a communist revolution. And there's been times in Ethiopia, even today in some places, where it's illegal to have this flag or any symbol of the Ethiopian monarchy on your person.
colors represent the rainbow that the Almighty showed to Noah after the flood. And the lion is from the book of Revelation, Revelation 5, verse 5. And this is the personal symbol of Ethiopian emperors, representing Jesus Christ. And Haile Selassie is the last emperor of Ethiopia. In 2019, we had a very special day here, and it was the unveiling of our blue plaque. And there was two blue, blue plaques unveiled that day, one in Western Supermare, one here. And Prince Michael McConnon, the emperor's grandson, was here to do the unveiling. And all our communities were here to share in the experience. Prince Michael is someone that spoke very openly and emotionally to us at Fairfield House about what it means to him that these symbols of Ethiopia have remained in the world. Because he was put in prison for being the emperor's grandson in 1975, and he was there for almost 15 years. He said that his biggest fear whilst he was in prison was that Ethiopians had forgotten these kids, their history, and all these symbols had been erased. But he said, he told us that someone got a message to him whilst he was in prison to say, don't worry, there's a man called Bob Marley around. The Rastafari movement is growing and they've adopted these symbols. They're going to help protect them for us. That's what he was told. Bob Marley is rumoured to have visited Fairford House in the 1970s. It was a residential care home, so we don't have any record of it. It would have just been one of the workers saying, Margaret, there's some Rastas in the garden, and it would have been Bob Marley. Um, but Bob Marley has a, a lyric in one of his songs where he illustrates what he's doing for Ethiopia. He says, I'm guarding the palace so majestic. I'm guarding the palace so realistic. So as we walk into Fairfield House, we walk past the little bust of Bob Marley. He's guarding the palace for us. the Emperor, Fairfield House was said to be an exceptionally quiet house and it was reported in the newspaper that there was a bewildering number of clocks. Everybody was supposed to know the Emperor's schedule and where he was at a particular time of day. At five o'clock in the morning, every morning, he'd be in the chapel where we just stood and his day is reported to end around one o'clock in the morning. So he'd work a 20-hour day with four hours rest. And he's known for doing something similar to this throughout his reign in Ethiopia. This room, which is our gift shop today, this was the family dining room. And Her Majesty Empress Menin is said to have made this into a little Ethiopia, so the family would feel at home. They had some fine rugs on the floor, they had some Ethiopian watercolours on the wall. And they had some Ethiopian silverware, some of the imperial silverware they brought with them. But just two months after moving into Fairford House, they were forced to sell this because they were going through such hard financial times. These are the types of items we'd like to have returned to us. The family also had two Ethiopian chefs that prepared meals that they were used to, and the chefs ran out of, Indian, of Ethiopian spices, so they found Indian spices to recreate the Ethiopian flavors. After a while, with the emperor's children and grandchildren living here in different periods, dishes like shepherd's pie, and trifle were added to the family recipes and they had an English chef working here after a while as well. So we go now into the double drawing room, the main living room space in the time of the Emperor and Empress, still for us today. themselves to gather 
um, and they came to see the head of the household. But that wasn't the emperor, it was Her Majesty the Empress who was the head of the household in that time. And they came to ask her, do you know when your husband will reach his capital? And even if the Empress did know the date that the Emperor planned on, she certainly wasn't going to tell the journalists that were gathered there. But they took really nice photographs of her on that day. And if you look at the fireplace detail next to Her Majesty here, and you look down, you'll see this is her sitting just about here on that day in April 1941. And then we recently found this photograph also. And this is the Emperor and Empress's eldest daughter, their eldest child, Princess Tananyawak. She's standing in that corner of the room before a lift was put in in the 1960s when it became a residential care home. And she's with her mum, the Empress. They're with the two dogs of the family. This is Rosa and Lulu. And Rosa was like a celebrity in Britain in her own right because she refused to leave the Emperor's side in the battle and she had a shrapnel injury in her eye and she had to have her eye removed by the doctors in, in the, on the battlefield. And it was reported in British newspapers that a war hero would soon come to Britain who's fought the fascists on the front line and they were talking about Rosa the dog in that time. <laughs> Um, so we think that during this time, 1941, the dogs have been semi-retired and their job is just guard the Empress and the household here at Fenfield House. So as we walk into this side of the room, if you note these photographs, this is how the, the house was decorated for the Emperor's return visit in 1954, 70 years ago, this October. This one is facing that way, that would be the Empress's chair there. This one is facing this way, with the piano, the fireplace, the conservatory door, all the same today. Oh, right, that's the piano and that's the fireplace right there. This is so it. what we think we have here at Fairfield House is quite a transformative story for the city of Bath in particular. Because when the Emperor and his family were here, these Ethiopian refugees, it became very obvious that they were going through difficult financial circumstances. And the people of Bath did everything they could do to look after the Emperor and his family. We know that deliveries of coal happened here so that the house could be kept warm. We know that people delivered food, packages, postal orders to the Emperor as well. And when the head of the local electricity board visited and he saw the Emperor and his family with thick rugs across their legs in winter time, he felt ashamed and he decided to waive the fees for the family which is really nice, and we live in hope that there's still such kindness today from electricity companies. <laughs> um, so you can hear now a minute of reactions of local residents of Bath to the emperor being in the city. This was a family household, and as parents there would have been times when they just had to hold it together for their children and their grandchildren that were living here. And we have a special item at Fairford House that represents the Emperor and Empress's time. It's the Emperor's original pianola that's over there. And Pauline is going to tell us about the Emperor's original pianola. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to Fairfield and the pianola. The pianola has its own story, so I'll say that first, but we always get to tell people that on Radio 5, you can check it out and it's tell its own story. But yes, it were the sadness that was going on, but it was a place of for the children, a refuge for, you know, from outside and all the bad news that the um, emperor and the family. So the music became a shield for protecting, and you will hear across the house lots of different music being played. But the pianola, anyone know what a pianola is? Any pianists in the Any room? Pianists? It's like an organ, piano? Similar, similar. So this is it, it has its own book, so it's not published, it's in publication. So. Piano is an automated self-playing pian piano. So this is the piano here. I'm not a pianist, so don't, they don't look for anything better than that. <laughs> for the pianola, it has some pedals here. So I'll take that out. You can see here there's some scrolls. 
and this is what they look like. So when the pin dollar was returned to us many years ago, it came with about a hundred scrolls. We couldn't play them, we didn't know how to play it, but someone through a festival, a Freedom of the City festival got it and um, sorted for us, and we've even brought some new tunes to it. So behind here is this. Um, the book is here, you can have a look at it after, because it's got this little tube. Sometimes it's best to show than to talk, that you can see it's got some little holes underneath the hair. So when I play in a moment, or when any of you decide to come and play, you will hear this tune. And then we have name this tune. Okay, so you get your foot on the pedal, and you start to pump. So I'll just give you a moment. That's your well, moment. Okay. Yeah, I feel you need to be to play an album, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's nice. I think Are that's you awesome. getting up? Were you coming? No. So no, no, no. no. So if you go on the BBC Radio website, BBC Sounds, and you type in Pianola, you'll find a half an hour radio program just about this item. Uh, and there's more to come. Wow. And so this is the original. Thank you guys. Thank you. Okay, so now we go upstairs. Thank you, Molly. We learned this um, from his autobiography as well as the accounts of visitors. We learned from his autobiography what his reading habits are while he's at Fairfield House. We know he read the Bible every day, he was very religious. But whilst he was here, he also said he had the chance to read the works of church fathers and leaders such as Abraham Lincoln and Napoleon. And with Napoleon especially, Napoleon had triumphantly overcome exile, so it was as if the emperor was looking for inspiration in history in the century before, to see how exactly am I going to do this, return to my country as an emperor. We're doing a project called the Testimonies Project, and we're recording oral histories, memories that people have of the emperor and their family or family stories that are here in Britain. And last year we had a very special visitor, a lady called Mrs. Bridget Wakefield. She's 93 years old today and lives in the city. And when she was at the signing desk down there, she looked over her shoulder and she said, I can remember him sitting there. So the memories of Emperor Haile Sassi sitting there in the 1930s are still alive in the city of Bath today. Bridget told us that her parents, her dad especially, was the Empress's doctor here. He was very close to the household. He received post here at Fairfield House. And she said that her parents went to the Empress's liberation party and they came home to tell, tell them about it. And she told us that the Empress had musicians stationed here for her liberation party. And we found out since that the princesses of Ethiopia decorated the hallway with flower displays. So people were dancing their way in triumphantly on that day in May 1941 to celebrate the Ethiopia's liberation. And these aren't original thrones, so you're welcome to come and see, see how you feel as an emperor or empress. How do you feel? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. If only we could all have a place halfway up our stairs to just pause for thought, you know? So we go now into the prince's room, which is over there.
Wow. There's a palace in Ethiopia that the emperor and empress had to leave, and it's called the Genet Leo Palace. And um, the emperor gave this to become Ethiopia's first university in the 1960s. You can visit the Genet Leo Palace today, and what you find is that there's interconnecting rooms between the emperor and empress's chambers. So on a very small scale here at Fairfield House, they were able to replicate this, because that's the emperor's living space, his bedroom going that way. We're in their shared living room space now, more of the Empress's living room, and that's her personal and private space over here. This room over here is the Kidani Meheret prayer room. It's a sanctified room for the Ethiopian Orthodox faith, the faith of the Emperor and Empress, and it's a very special remembrance for the Empress because she was a woman of great prayer and faith while she was here. She even gifted her crown, pledged it to the church if Ethiopia was liberated, so her, her crown remains in the church. Um, so you're welcome to enter the prayer room, just please remove your shoes before you do. In this room, this is our new exhibition space here, and this is telling the story of the Emperor's world travels from 1924 to 1974. He's the most travelled human being, he's the most decorated human being in the Guinness World Records. He had visited over 167 countries, and each time usually returning to Ethiopia with something of material value. So up there is a world map of over 85% of the Emperor's travels on there, um, across the different decades according to colour code. We have a replica of the Emperor's famous uniform, the elephant tusk holder, the tusks themselves were stolen out of the Guildhall, but that's been loaned to us by the Bath Rest Record Office, and um, the story of the Emperor in these different continents across the world going in this room. But now we go to our final stop, which is our museum space and the Emperor's bedroom, his former bedroom. This was the Emperor's bedroom, and this is where we know he had some of the most difficult moments in his life in this space. The Emperor said that the view from this window reminded him of the hills of Harar, and that's the province where he was born in Ethiopia, and where he grew up, and where his dad was the governor of, and he became the governor of. So to look out of this front window, the Emperor saw home, he saw Africa, it shows how his mind was never far from home. And to look out of the back window, the Emperor also saw a vision of home, because above that cabinet, that's a picture of the greenhouse chapel there, Sedet and Yomad Hali Alem, the saviour of the world in exile, his church here at Fairfield House and it, he looked right out this window at it. We know that when the emperor and his daughter, they found out about the loss of the emperor's son-in-law, Ras Desta, that the royal family were mourning in this space for three days during that time, according to testimonial accounts, people that worked in the house. Over the years, we've had lots of items and artefacts donated or loaned to us at Fairfield, and it's only in recent years that we've begun to arrange these as a museum, and we're on the pathway to museum accreditation. Arguably an even more important item to this house. This item here belonged to one of the Emperor's daughters, and when there was really hard financial times here, she went into the city of Bath and sold this to someone so she would have a little bit of money to bring to her household. So the family that she sold it to, they knew how special it was. They kept hold of it, passed it down the generations, and they gifted it to us to be on display so that we can tell that story, especially to Ethiopians, so that they know how much their emperor and empress suffered, put themselves through here for Ethiopia's freedom. Of course, as I've mentioned, Ethiopia was liberated with support from Britain and the Ethiopian patriots in 1941, and there's some mementos of that here, including a letter that the Emperor sent from Fairfield House to Winston Churchill. But the tour and the story ends over here. Maybe on the front. Okay. okay. But his achievements rebuilding our Ethiopia after the war and for Africa and the world weren't finished. Because in 1963, Emperor Haile Selassie called all the nations of Africa to his capital, Addis Ababa. 
and in 72 hours he had founded what became known as the African Union and it still sits in Addis Ababa today, at Africa's diplomatic capital. For this achievement, the emperor was awarded the official title the Father of Africa by 32 independent African countries and he got them to sign the Charter of African Unity. Later that year, October 1963, Emperor Haile Sassi was in New York being received by President John F. Kennedy. He had with him the Charter of African Unity and he was taking it to the United Nations headquarters. When the Emperor was to speak to the United Nations, the journalists asked the question, what is this world leader that gave a prophetic warning of doom to the world 27 years before? What is he going to say to us this time round? The context was the civil rights movement and the nuclear arms race, and Emperor Haile Selassie didn't disappoint. He told the United Nations that until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned, there'll be no peace on earth. Thank you very much. So guys, this is one of his original suits he would wear right here. All right, guys, so obviously there's a lot of stuff I'm not going to show you. I'm not going to go into the sacred room. I'm not going to show you that. That would, I'm going to go in, but I'm not taking you, okay? <laughs> That's something you have to come to do yourself. But I will do this for you. I'll show you his view. So imagine him sitting, standing here, and just, or maybe even closer here, and just looking out the window. And... Thinking about his home, thinking about what was gonna happen. Oh, it's been to give away one for free. I don't think it's gonna one for free yet, so. Oh, all right, guys. So, oh, wow, thank you. I appreciate you, man. Wow. <laughs> Oh, man. I was just about to show you the, uh, that they have food after um, the tour, and I got one for free. But if you are coming here, guys, yeah, you, after a good tour, get some nice Ito food. Okay, nice. All right, guys. So these guys are also taking donations. Sorry, I didn't show you everything. That was the that was the promise. So a lot of stuff I cut off. But uh, you're taking donations. How, how can yeah um, you can donate if you go on our website fairfieldhousebath.co.uk right. then you will see a donation link there and it takes you to our local giving page um, you can donate that way perfect all right to come guys. here and to follow us on social media house of his majesty instagram facebook tiktok all you right know. all right guys so an honor to meet you uh, no thank you thank you for allowing me to have a little access of filming and uh yeah guys if you are in town or you never knew how close this is if you're in london or you're in uk you gotta spend some time you go you come in the bath come over here show some love some support all right this is uh, one of the only community run heritage attractions in the uk you know and probably the newest black history experience in britain right yeah. all right thank you man all, all right, right yeah